Welcome to The Future of What. I'm your host, Portia Sabin, president of the independent record label, Hill Rockstars. Every June, there's a conference in New York City for independent labels and their industry partners called Indie Week. This year, I moderated a panel at Indie Week called Cataloging the Past While Looking to the Future. The general theme of this panel was how labels market the two different types of releases they have, new releases and new bands, and catalog or older releases. On this panel, I talked to people who work for labels with very impressive rosters that include artists like Paul McCartney, Joan Baez, Count Basie, Mac DeMarco, Dive, Perfect Pussy, The Rolling Stones, Sam Cooke, M83, and Depeche Mode. Can all these artists be marketed the same way? And how does it benefit a label to have a wide spectrum of artists? Find out now on The Future of What. The name of this panel is Cataloging the Past While Looking to the Future. And the moderator today is Portia Sabin from Kill Rock Stars. Thanks, Cheryl. So let me introduce the panel to get started. So way down at the end, we have Jim Selby, who is the general manager of Concord Records. We have Dave Martin, who is the sales director for Omnian Music Group. We have Sarah Jane Dempsey, who is the director of sales and marketing for ABCO. And Nicole Blonder, who's the VP of marketing for Mute Records. So to kick it off today, I think we're going to start by talking about this title, Cataloging the Past While Looking to the Future. The interesting thing about all the record labels that are represented by these people on the panel today is that all of these labels are old. (laughs) They have a lot of history, and we all have really pretty deep catalogs. And that really is a different situation and scenario than young labels face right, in today's marketplace. I mean, I have for a couple of years now been saying, why would anyone get into the music business in, you know, 2010, 11, 12, 13? And yet every year people do and they manage to make it work, which is great. We're not those people. We are the other people. (laughs) We are the people who've been doing this for a long time. And there's a huge difference because catalog is a particularly different animal to brand new upfront releases. So I wanted to get into that a little bit by just talking to having everybody here speak to the idea of, you know, what have they got in their archives? What's, what have you got in your closet? Like what's, what's the important stuff in your catalog? What do you guys hold on to and say, oh, like this, you know, these are the important releases, you know, let's start with Jim Selby. I mean, you're new to Concord, but that's a, that's a big label with a lot of, a lot of stuff. Yes. A lot of history in the catalog, you know, from you know, Stax, Fantasy, all the way, you know, Credence, Clearwater, you know, real deep catalog stuff that we still own tapes that are in ma- that are in vaults that we actually haven't digitized yet. And, and, you know, that's how kind of deep our catalog stuff goes. But yeah, very deep. Right. And so how does having catalog like that create a fan base for you? So, you know, when people come to Concord or they come to Stax, you know, your interactions with the people, your public's, you guys are cool because you own several different kinds of labels, so you have fingers in different pies. But wouldn't you say that there are definite markets for each different label, depending on what people think of that label? Yeah, and there's similar markets between some of the label groups as well, too, which helps with the marketing of it. And marketing catalog, in some ways, can be more difficult and in other ways a little easier than marketing new releases. There is a built-in fan base for a lot of the catalog we have, so repackaging, you know, that content into, you know, as, as every new media kind of comes out, you know, now vinyl, everybody's looking for certain releases that we had back in our old catalog to be re-released in collector's versions of vinyl and stuff, you know, previously was having everything released in digital. So everything is, you know, we have the opportunity to kind of go back to these fan bases and, and represent it. But, you know, then developing a new fan base outside of the core fan base is just you know, extremely important to us as well, too. So trying to find new fans of our catalog, you know, is almost, that's the difficult part of marketing is going and finding those new fans. How do you find them? Where do they are? Where do they are? Because marketing to them is different than how we would market to kind of our core fan base for those labels. So, 
And that's a big challenge, I think, for all labels is to sort of do that dance of how do you market to your catalog versus how do you market to new fans. So Nicole at Mute, how, I mean, you guys have an excellent storied history. I assume a lot of people come to Mute because of that, but then you also have a lot of new acts. So how do you work that little angle? So I mean, we have a really diverse catalog. We have people that know the label from the artists that we worked with in the, in the late 70s and 80s, like Depeche Mode or Erasure, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, and then there's people that know us from you know the last 10 years, like M83 or The Knife, Jose Gonzalez. So it's interesting because you know a lot of the older fans may or may not be interested in the new material, and a lot of the you know, newer fans you know may not really know about the older stuff. So I think that for us, primarily, there's a really good opportunity to, to cross market. And social media is obviously really important and seeing who's engaging where, but trying to use our catalog in different contexts. So we've done, particularly with streaming, we've done you know different themed playlists where you sort of draw people in based on what they like, create a playlist around a newer artist and pepper in some older things. And then you can promote that playlist over and over again. We've done, we have a Spotify playlist that we do regularly called the Mute Mixtape that we promote on our own socials. We have a YouTube playlist as well. So that's, that's one way. But it is, it is really challenging, particularly as fans of the older material and thus are a little bit older, are a little bit less amenable to newer music, shall we say. So I think it's about kind of finding the opportunities to cross market artists new artists that are similar to older artists and vice versa and really you have to really know your catalog well and you have to find the opportunities to get in there with a particular song or particular artist and if you like this then you might like this but in ways that that are authentic and real and not like too marketing for lack of a better word. Dave do you find the similar situation because you guys have like flying nuns catalog and yeah I mean for us you know we have specific labels and some of them are are primarily catalog based, and then you know, or like Captured Tracks, which is a mixture of new bands but with key reissues, maybe you know, licensed catalog or things like that. And we we like to think of it as symbiotic that the the new acts will get young kids to discover the old acts. And as Nicole said, I mean, sometimes with the older fans, they're not as open to new acts. I mean, maybe you know, a little set in their ways. But we like to think that that if you were brought in on one level, that you might have an interest in another. Yeah. What do you think, Sarah? Because you guys have uh, uh, some very inspirational ti older titles. I think that the most important thing in thinking about all of the different labels that we're talking about is the, the rich history we all have. And, you know, we have the Rolling Stones and we have Sam Cooke and we have Cameo Parkway. It's finding ways to tell the story of that music. And I think new musicians, new artists are always influenced by what came before. So it's always going to be resurfacing. They're going to be covering older songs. They're going to be referencing in their interviews um, who they've been inspired by. It's our job to find those moments and really resurface, whether it's through streaming, whether it's through social media, it's our job to tell that that rich history, that rich story. I think that's the hardest part is obviously people, people's attention spans are dwindling, not only younger people, but I think older people too. So where do we tell those stories and how do we get people's you know, attention to tell them? So I think when I, when I think about catalog artists and I think about how we work our catalogs, it's exactly what you said. We're, we're trying to... we. We're trying to both bring in the people who are excited, who know these artists and love these artists, like let's say the Rolling Stones. Someone is like, I want Rolling Stones. So they go and they buy Rolling Stones. The question is, how do you then capture those people who are maybe really young and barely even know who the Rolling Stones are? You know, how do you find those markets? And I thought it was interesting, Nicole said you guys do a Spotify playlist. So it's like you go to where the kids are, put your stuff there and then say, maybe they'll notice this, maybe they'll like this. I mean, you definitely want to be on streaming. And I, I think it's great, like, you know, the, the Beatles are finally on streaming. I was worried that there would be a whole generation of, of kids who just never got to hear it. And, you know, you can talk about the business model of it, but I think just the exposure that this fantastic music should be available, this rich heritage, it's really the canon, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, our experience with that is, of course, we have a particular sound, like Kill Rock Stars. I think people would say there's a Kill Rock Stars sound and it's been female fronted rock bands 
for 25 years. And it's funny because I feel like I've now decided that I will never put out another band that's just dudes ever again. So don't send me your demos. Don't want to see them. It's not going to work. Because it's, it's like that's not actually what our fans are looking for. So I think it is, it's a double-edged sword. It's great to know that you can sell certain things. But then on the other hand, it's like, well, I can't sell these other things. Do you guys ever have that experience where you're like, there's just something that's not going to work on our label? We might love it. For us, it's sort of hard to pinpoint what that is. I mean, there's definitive things that we don't have. Like, we don't really have hip-hop or gospel or like, you know, but we have things that sort of teeter on the edge of other genres. But, you know, we don't have one kind of genre focus. For Mute, it's more of a, an aesthetic and a sort of vibe because, we, you know, we have really, just really diverse catalogs. So but it's just, like I said, I think it's just a feeling. And, you know, we do try and we do attempt to market to a lot of different types of people, but it's all sort of kind of in the same realm of music fans and music lovers and people that are sort of interested in, in left field genre defying types of artists. Dave, do you guys have a different experience because you have multiple labels? Not so much, actually. I mean, we found that, that no matter what, I mean, if you look at, you know, Flying Nun and Captured Tracks, although they're separated by many years, really, the fan base is kind of typical, maybe, or something. And, you know, we found that whenever we try to step too far outside of whatever genre has been put upon us, even that even though it might make perfect sense to us that, you know, it's, it's pretty hard sometimes to just get that message across that, you know, to us, it's like, I don't, it's great. Why don't people like it? You know, well, to ask if you had any examples of that, I'm just curious. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> Jim, because like a group like Concord, that's a whole lot of labels, and I'm assuming each of them has their own A and R team. Yeah, we we just wouldn't take any female rock artists. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. With all the diverse label groups, we this happens to us all the time. You know, we know what our lanes are. We're pretty disciplined on our A and R, but things like urban and pop is not something that we just don't feel that. We want to compete with, you know, the majors and, and others that do that genre really well. So it's something that we kind of avoid. And we know where we do well in the rock, Americana, bluegrass, and we have great teams, great relationships there. And it's kind of our main lane and we stick in it. So, Have you guys ever swapped an artist? Like if, you know, it comes into rounder or something and oh all the like, time oh we can't we can't put this out but you guys should check them out all the time we, really That's yes cool. that happens all the time we're and and the thing is we we have general a and r people too so they're not dedicated to one specific label group they're you know reviewing projects every day and would find a project that might work uh, on rounder it might work on concord it might work on you know fantasy so yeah we have kind of general a and r people that do that so so Jim McDermott, if you missed his keynote speech, he said something that I thought was, it really blew my mind because I was, I hadn't thought about this in years, but it used to be that when you had an older release that had been around for years, you'd put it in the nice price bin at the record store, <laughs> it would be like, you know, $8.99 for, you know, something that's old. And I feel like things have really changed now so much that we can actually price our older releases higher in a lot of cases because there's more demand for something that's very recognizable. I mean, I'm thinking in my own catalog, the Elliott Smith records, you know, it's like, those are always going to be, I could, I don't, it doesn't matter how much I charge for those. Like people are going to buy those no matter what. And that's so interesting because that's a total shift in the, in the business, in my, in my humble opinion. Do you guys find a similar thing or do you still, are there titles that you still have to put in the nice price? I love to raise the price and everything. <laughs> I, I think it depends on what the, the retailer that you're working with, too. I think there are certain things that you price for velocity, that you price to move, that you price for Father's Day, that you price around, you know, certain events. And then I think you're right that, you know, there are things that are evergreen, that are collectible, that people know and love, you know, front to back, that you can price you know, more flexibly. But I also think, like, I remember growing up and going to Tower Records and all the records that I wanted were always the 1899 records, you know? So I feel like there is, you know, not that much has changed, maybe. <laughs> You're nodding. You're yeah, I mean, I think it's true. We have certain evergreen titles that, you know, have done well for us, 
for us, you know, whatever in the last 10 to 15 years that we don't discount unless it's part of a larger push with maybe the artists' other titles that don't do so well and we're trying to get an artist spotlight at what particular retailer or because they're going on tour, we want to kind of push the whole artist catalog as a whole, we would do it. But we never really raise the price on things unless it's sort of like we're raising the price on all of our vinyl or all of our CDs and then, then we would. But you know, there's definitely titles that you know, we don't have to put on sale and they consistently sell week after week just because like you said, it's, people are going to want it and they're always going to want it because it's reached that, it's past the threshold right. where it's sort of like in the general ether of music. And there's always somebody's birthday coming up, you know, so you have to buy it for that person or whatever. Drink up, baby, stay up all night with the things you could do. You won't, but you might. The potential you'll be that you'll never see. The promises you'll only make. Drink up with me now and forget all about the pressure. them away the images stuck in your head people you've been before that you don't want around anymore that push and shove and won't bend to your will I'll keep them still drink up Between the Bars by Elliot Smith. If you're enjoying this program, please subscribe to our show on iTunes. To find out what's coming up next, follow us on Twitter at KRSFOW. You're listening to The Future of What? We're listening to a panel called Cataloging the Past While Looking to the Future. Now we're going to talk about Spotify because there's this statistic floating around that I'm really interested in. I would love your guys' opinion from your own business situations. There's a statistic floating around that only 1% of the music on Spotify is actually listened to. 99% of the music on Spotify is actually clicked on one, like played officially like once or less. And that's a really crazy statistic. But I'm interested because we recently did a, a little brief little survey of our most recent releases. And we found that the only releases that were getting plays on Spotify were the tracks that we'd released as singles. And the entire rest of the album would be not listened to. I just wanted to throw this out here because it's just an interesting, you know, if everyone is saying the future is streaming, right? We're talking about the future of music. What are we going to do? How are we all going to make money in the future? What do we do if it turns out that only a few tracks are actually getting listened to? I mean, I would also say that's, that's part of the nature of Spotify is it's, it's very single driven and it's also a very young demographic. There are certain things that Spotify does really well. I think other streaming services have more of a label push so you can hope for, for more streaming. But I think that is the challenge with streaming is that there is going to be so much content and how to make it discoverable and how to make, you know, how to have it be surfaced, you know, interestingly on the service itself. Again, another thing that, you know, plays into 
the Spotify ecosystem is the fact that playlists are about singles. So if you can get on those top Spotify playlists, that's fantastic, but it's fantastic usually for that song. Hey, how do you feel about that, Dave? You're looking uh, like you had something to say. Same. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's exactly the same. I mean, being old, like when I interact with Spotify, I interact like, oh. uh, yes, <laughs> I interact like it, like I would with my records. I, I go and I listen to a whole record because I'm old, but you know, my kids, I don't know if they've ever listened to a whole record and they live in a house of, you know, 5,000 or more LPs that they don't care about but they listen to music all the time. So I, I don't know if in this case with Spotify specifically, it seems to be more of a feature that is Spotify specific. I was gonna argue that I don't even think that it's, I think they're voracious music listeners and there's so much out there on streaming. It's like, how could you, how could you spend the time listening to a whole album? I need, I need more, I need to hear all of these things. I mean, sometimes I feel that way. I guess that makes sense. Well, I mean, obviously we're talking about consumption, right? Music consumption and music consumption has changed significantly. I mean, as we found that out when the CD era ended, right? That people were actually interested in singles. And yet it really begs an interesting question because we just keep making albums, you know? And artists always want to make albums. I mean, I have yet to meet an artist who's like, no, I just want to make a single. I mean, and, and that wouldn't fit our business model either. So it's, it's interesting. It's like, are we behind the times? Are we on top of the times? Are we confused? Are we clinging desperately to an old model? I also think there, I think there are artists where people will listen again to every single song on that new album. And I think, you know, right now it's some of these big, huge pop artists or hip hop artists who have made sort of event listening type, type things, but people... People are consuming and have opinions on every single song on that record. So I think, I think at least in that one regard, you know, there is success in terms of albums. But I, I think you're right. Singles. Are, are, it's a scary place to think about. But it has to be singles off albums. That's the part that's really weird. It is yeah. not, it's not good enough if it's, just, if it's just a single. Well, we still release singles off mm. albums, right? Like singles come first to right. tease the whole album. It's, right. it's how do you release enough singles that are strong enough from an album that it translates into someone engaging on the whole album. I wonder though, I wonder if we, is it like some sort of purity test for artists? Are we like, we need to know if you can actually write more than one song. Like maybe that's why we want to do albums. So we're like, no, you need to write at least 10 songs before I, you know, put my money and time into you. Because, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I get demos, I get demos all the time where it's like, you can go here and listen to my song. And I'm like, your song? I'm not your mom. Like, yeah, you wrote a song. Like, write 10 more, write 20 more, write 100 more. You know, you gotta, you gotta, this is a job. Do you want this as a job? Or do you want to just, you know, write one song and then everyone say, great job? You guys don't have this problem, apparently. <laughs> Sometimes I'm looking for a little less. Like, you know, you get these records and they have too many songs. Oh. Yeah. Like, at records yeah. delivered to you? Or, or just uh, people All sending over. you? Records delivered, records that I, you know, think that I might want, records that I just encounter. Just like, oh, 15 songs? Well, <laughs> you know, seems a bit much. It, it yeah. does. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. Really, people deliver records with 15 songs? Yes. I feel yeah. like I haven't been able to get artists to deliver 10 songs in years. It's like they show up with nine, <laughs> nine and a half. Yeah. I guess that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, other ways of consumption. So Pandora and Sirius. So people listening, listening to singles. We've actually seen more deep tracks listened to and this is where catalog comes in on things like services like Pandora, these either non-interactive, non-interactive streaming sor sources, you know, do you guys find that that's the case with you too? We've got, I mean, I've seen both. I, we work pretty closely with them and definitely like for a couple of our artists who have really big hits for lack of a better term, those will always be the number one, but then the numbers like three through 10 most stream songs can often surprise me. And what's really interesting to me is that I have a lot of friends who are not, not in the music industry at all, love music, don't have time to like sit through and scroll and do all of their, you know, digging or they don't go record shopping anymore and they just put Pandora on and they discover a lot of music that way. So it's really interesting 
to reach a demographic of people that way who are active music listeners, but maybe not more pass they're actively passive, passively active. Yeah. Something like that. And it and because of their thumbs up, thumbs down system, you know, it's a little bit more democratic in a way than like program radio. Mm -hmm. So I I think those services can be really valuable from a discovery point of view as well for a certain type of music fan. Absolutely. So can we talk about Spotify playlist curation and pay to play as uh, everyone is now concerned the majors are engaging in? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's smart that everyone has a playlisting strategy and I think it's smart that the majors have each built their brand, right? They have very strong brands that Spotify has, you know, showcases prominently. I don't know about pay to play. Obviously, there are people who got into the Spotify curation game early who have huge followings and have done really well. But I hope that they are still like seeking to be editorial voices. I mean, and that's why they've they developed those followers in the first place. And I think it's actually, you know, as someone who oversees the Spotify playlisting strategy for my own label, I think it is very hard to get insane number of followers. So I think they must have been doing something very well. I think it's harder to game the system than we think. But Well, that's what I'm hoping, because it sort of still seems that way. I mean, we released a record this year, and it's already gotten on three or four different Spotify playlists, and I don't have anyone doing your job. Maybe I can call you after this panel. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I don't have someone doing that for me. It's just happened really organically, and that's nice for me to know that that's still possible. I think that's just like a fear out there in the industry that that's going to come down on our heads and we're suddenly going to have that avenue sh shut down to getting our music out into the world. Jim, what's been your, how do, how do you, your group of labels interact with Spotify? It's obviously an extremely important service for us. And we do have people that are actively pursuing our tracks on Spotify, the key Spotify playlists. And, and I would say though, for us, and this may not be for everybody in this room, but the Spotify you know, own playlists seem to be far more important than any other kind of playlist. Although it's good to get on some of these other social playlists and, and you know, genre type playlists and stuff, but none of them seem to drive the amount of streams that we get when it's a Spotify official playlist, Just, you know, kind of the coveted ones for us. So, yeah, I mean, that's the same thing. The Spotify official playlists are just the, the gold standard, I guess, <laughs> but you know, for, for labels like ours, we're, you know, obviously working, you know, more in the margins, doing our own playlists, hoping to get included on others. And I mean, everything is fantastic in those terms. Once you've accepted Spotify, you know, like, yeah, you hope to get placed as many places as you can, but that confused emoji is what I'm trying to go for. <laughs> like, for those yeah. of you listening at home, the confused emoji. So do, I, do any of you guys do windowing? Because windowing is another technique that a lot of us, we do that all the time with Spotify where we keep sales off, we keep albums off of Spotify for a period of time, like, like let's say a month after release date. And I think that's interesting for several reasons. One is it gives people a chance to buy the record in some format and you can't just stream it, which you know we, we feel like is not punitive. We feel like that's okay for our business model. But then after the album's out and it's no longer this hot new thing that just exploded onto the scene, we hope, it's available and it sort of turns into that catalog that we then all work with for the rest of eternity, we hope. Is that something that you guys have found we've, useful? We've done it on, on some records and I can't tell you if it really worked or not. It was a strategy that the label and the artist came up with and we basically just kind of honored their wishes. And we've done it both the other, we've done it the other way too, where we've actually issued exclusive streaming to one, one streaming partner. And again, I, I can't tell you if it was, you know, more successful than launching it to everyone. Not everybody's Taylor Swift and can do that kind of, and have that kind of success. Did it drive more sales? I think in some ways it drove more of our D to C sales because there were some interesting collections that we had done or some interesting bundles that we had done that were on D to C that seemed to exceed our expectations on what we would have sold, but was it a huge success? I, I don't know. It's too hard to tell. I mean, we've, we've done some of it and sometimes, you know, with our soundtracks, we don't necessarily have streaming rights say, or, or maybe it's thinking about windowing. I mean, I think windowing is interesting for the industry and I think most often it's been used by these superstars. And I think you're right. When you use it on a smaller scale, how can you tell it's, if it's successful or not? But for me, it's important to make 
our releases available on streaming because I think there is a whole set of customer who uses streaming to know what they would want to then purchase, to know what they might want then to buy the vinyl on. So I want to make sure it's available for them too because I think there is a lot of discovery there. But I think there are probably interesting ways to use streaming and whether it's whether it's teasing it on YouTube or, you know, there's a whole, a whole world of streaming, you know, outside of Spotify. I think it's good for the music industry to, to experiment that way. And I don't know if the answer is, yeah, exclusives or windowing, but I think it's, it's good to try all avenues.
was Neskowin by the Corn Tucker Band. If you're enjoying this program, like us on Facebook and become a subscriber on iTunes. You're listening to The Future of What? We're listening to a panel called Cataloging the Past While Looking to the Future. So Jim brought up D2C, which is direct-to-consumer, direct-to-customer, direct-to-fan, DTF. And that's become a huge thing in recent years for most labels. Would you guys agree that that's absolutely a big deal for you? Yeah, I mean, it's growing slowly, but it's become, I think, more important for our artists, primarily as they kind of focus on their own ecosystem and sort of the fan experience and what the fan will buy and what they want and sort of the connection between the artist and the fan. We've sort of recently relaunched our own, our label, G2C, and it's just sort of getting off the ground now so that, and we're trying to experiment with different things. So that's just kind of growing. But I think for the artist and as the sort of, that relationship becomes more and more important with social media, of course, involved. The, I've seen every one of our artists, if they didn't have a D2C in the last, you know, if they released a record in the last two to three years, they've started one. Or we've said, you should really start one. And then they have. And certain artists have been more successful than others with certain deluxe offerings and ticket, ticket album bundles, which is something that you know, feels important as well to sort of capture sales. So, it, you know, it's, it's one of the many different ways I think that you know, you can reach people. We haven't, just to go back to your previous point, we've not done windowing. I think in general, our viewpoint is to have your music available everywhere for discovery on every platform that people listen to music. Right. Dave, how about you guys? I'm sure well, you guys have done yes, some cool I mean, DTC stuff. For, for us, it's, it's vital. You know, it's really just, especially, you know, captured tracks specifically, DTC is, is, is such a huge part of it that we wouldn't, I don't know, we would have to entirely rethink our business model without it. I mean, it's unbelievable how big it is sometimes. What's the coolest thing you guys have made for Adidas E? Oh, oh, geez. I don't even know where to start. I mean, most Captured Tracks releases have a special edition that is sort of not quite a Adidas E exclusive, but the bulk of them are always sold there. And they can get pretty extreme. A lot of silk screened wraps, different colored vinyls, and it really it gets pretty extreme. That's been one of the funnest things for me about running a label in the last few years is the stuff that we get to make for pre-order bonuses and direct to fan because it's just, then we get to have fun. And that's another interesting thing about how the industry has changed. It used to be really expensive to make stuff and a lot of stuff is, is cheaper, but at the same time, we're local. Like we have a lot of really great people in our local community who make amazing stuff. Yeah, and so we get a bigger making. margin on it. So makes yeah. sense. Yeah. I wanted to ask you to say more about direct to fan for you guys because you have. Yeah, it's it's an area that we're continuing to invest in. We do well in it now, and we're building out that department even further, adding some more positions in it. It's something we believe in. We think it's a huge part of our business model going forward. So we are fully committed to direct to consumer. So let's turn to a sec for a second to A and R, which we not you guys don't necessarily do A and R. You're more the sales marketing teams, which is cool. But, you know, everybody does a little bit of everything at record labels. And, you know, have you guys got a sense of, I always like to ask this question because my sense is that regardless of what's actually happening in the music industry, there has not been a slowdown in the number of people who want to become musicians. It's like just as high as it ever was. And I've always been like, you guys, what is wrong with you? Like, why would you want to get into a business where you have, you know, tiniest percentage of making any money. And yet that doesn't stop art, which we should love, right? We should be like, yes, it's not going to stop art. Who gives a crap that you're not going to make any money? Yet people really still want to get into it. So what's been your feeling about that? Do you still feel like, yes, there's just as many people out there and they're making great music and we want to work with these bands? I think there might even be more. There's so much more information available. Everybody knows the odds of making it, you know, what those are. But then you know, if you step back, you can see like, oh, I understand I might not become the most famous artist in the world, but I could exist in this level and I could do this for a living. And this is how. So all of that information is out there, you know. And so I think that 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 information has maybe, you know, persuaded more people to to give it a go and to sort of wing it a little bit less. It's certainly not something ABCO does, but I was speaking to Allison from 300 before this, and she does A&R. And, you know, I asked, do you go to a ton of shows? Do you see a lot of live music? And what she said is, mostly I spend time on the internet. And I think the, you know, 
there has been a, a democratic process here where there is a lower barrier to entry, where there can be so much more music. And if what you're seeking is to be on Bandcamp and that's success for you, I think that's out there. Basically what they said, there's a slew, a plethora, of overloaded mountain of demos coming at us in all ways, shapes, and forms. If they could send a paper airplane with it, they would. You know, it's even last week, for anyone that was at Medem, Daniel Miller, our, our chairman founder, was giving a talk about A&R. And then they took questions. And afterwards, someone just came up and handed him a demo and said, it sounds like you too. And he's <laughs> like, okay, thanks. <laughs> you know, so it's just like any, and, and I think that it's amazing that the access is there so people can be creative and, and continue to make music. But I think then the, the filter has to be even stronger. You, you know, you have to really be sort of laser targeted and in, in how you listen to things and what's right for your label. There's no end to being pitched. Uh, certainly I'm in Nashville. So, you know, there's, there's no, I'm not worried if that's what you're concerned that there's the an end to new bands out there. No, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Someday we should have a Nashville panel. I, I mean, Nashville just seems like it must be, you must fall over musicians just walking down the street. Yeah. Well, or get tripped by them and get tripped yeah. by them. Yeah. <laughs> and they stuff a demo in your pocket. On the way yeah. <laughs> have you brought a catalog artist to a new market? I think actually we had a really nice campaign with can several years ago they had literally found some lost tapes in the mattress warehouse wherever they used to record stuff and we were able to put together a new release of old material called the lost tapes that we did a deluxe vinyl limited edition vinyl package on and then following that we had the reissue of their catalog on vinyl for the first time in i don't know how many years 30 years. And then we were able to release the lost tapes on CD after that. And even though Can is definitely sort of an evergreen artist, just because they're sort of at the forefront of electronic music, etc., a lot of modern music fans didn't know them, or they knew one song, or they knew a song, but they didn't know it was them, or they heard it sampled in a hip hop song, or what have you. So they're definitely a really good example of catalog artists for us that does really strong business. And there's and the individual members are still active, but as a band, they're not making new music. So that was a good success for us. Yeah, I, was, I meant to ask you guys, what have reissues meant for your labels? I know you guys actually own a reissue label that specifically does reissues. Yeah. I, I mean, we, we have a reissue label and then, you know, obviously Flying Nun is, you know, most of the records that we partner with them on are all reissues as well. And then, you know, then on Capture Tracks, there have been some key reissue projects over the years that have really kind of helped us sort of emphasize the link between new capture tracks artists and, and older music, things like, you know, the Cleaners from Venus reissues, you know, the Medicine reissues and some other shoegaze reissues, you know, that have really kind of helped tie, you know, like the late 2000s to you know, listener to, to earlier music, things like that. Have you guys used Record Store Day at all for sort of a big push for a reissue? Is that ever come up? Because I know some, some labels do do that. I mean, we've used it. I'm trying to think if there's been a specific reissue that we've tied it to, but I mean, Record Store Day is obviously its own monster, but we've usually participated in some way, shape, or form. We've definitely used Record Store Day, and you mentioned before briefly a birthday, and I was actually thinking of it in the context, you know, Anytime there's an anniversary or a birthday of our catalog, you know, anytime it's been 50 years, there's always an opportunity to resurface. Anytime it's, you know, the birthday of one of our fantastic artists, you know, making sure to celebrate that. And also, I was going to mention anytime, you know, an artist is covered, anytime there's a sync track, I mean, there's, there's many different ways to capture or to use that to resurface the catalog. Right. Bringing catalogs to the forefront, definitely.
we are tired, we've been worked to the bone. But nearly every day, we earn a lower wage. So tell you what we're made of, or what we just want. Against the Country by Horse Feathers. If you're enjoying this program, like us on Facebook and become a subscriber on iTunes. You're listening to The Future of What? We're listening to a panel called Cataloging the Past While Looking to the Future. I don't know. Can we escape the echo chamber of our own social media? Can anyone? I mean, I mean, I don't know if you do, but you continue to find, you know, maybe it's people sharing beyond that. There's the first person who likes the tweet, and then there's the first the person who discovers it. There's the person who you follow, you know, a playlist, and then someone else is browsing your profile and finds it. So hopefully, it's there's that first layer, and then hopefully there's secondary layers of discovery. And then also through the artists that are on it, if they're willing to share it themselves, and then if they're included on it, and then their fans can get exposed to other. Yeah, definitely the artist is the biggest advocate. Yeah, right? I mean, it's a little bit like second layer echo chamber, maybe. But I think what Sarah said is sort of right on. The sort of magic of social media and the, the web and the connections that it creates. You don't know where things are going to go. And so even though you think you're just promoting to your own following, you're actually promoting to all of their connections as well at the same time. And it's sort of those are all potential fans and customers all the time. And so incentivizing fans to share your, you know, Facebook posts, tweets, Tumblr, you know, Instagrams, incentivizing people to share beyond to their network and you know, thus reaching those people directly is sort of a first step that, that we do. And also I want to just point out that, as Jim said in his keynote, the game has changed with social media. So now Facebook makes us pay to reach our whole audience. You know, so it, whereas once you were just shooting it out and it went to everybody, now you have to pay to boost your post to reach part of your of your audience. So, I mean, it's 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 changed considerably, and I think we're all looking for ways to get out of that wormhole because it's actually now costing us money. The other thing, also, just to say, Portia, is that when you do pay, you actually can target people that are not in your fan base, and so you can pay to reach people that are not already in your fan base from the get if you want to put money into it. Thank you guys so much. We have Nicole Blonder, Sarah Dempsey, Dave, Martin, and Jim Selby. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Portia. Thank you so much to Portia and the panelists. Thank you. 
And that's our show. The music we played today was used by permission. You heard Elliot Smith, the Corn Tucker Band, Horse Feathers, and of course, our theme song, Mind Your Own Business by the Delta Five. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. For more info on the shows, check out our website at killrockstars.com slash the future of what. Our program was engineered by Brent Asbury at Beta Petrol and is produced by Will Watts and Anna McLean. I'm Portia Sabin, president of Kill Rockstars. See you next week. Can I have a taste of your ice cream? Can I listen?